Good evening, everyone. Spotlight Lecture Series presented by MTX Incorporated has been bringing the best speakers around the world in front of you, keeping up with the motive to inspire, excite, and motivate the Shastra community. On Tata Projects Limited, day three of Shastra 2022, we have with us one of the most prominent speakers in our lineup this year, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Honorable Member of the Parliament, Chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology, and a renowned author. Dr. Tharoor is a three-time Lok Sabha MP from Tiruvannandapuram and has previously served as Honorable MOS for HRD and External Affairs. Dr. Tharoor has been the Under Secretary General at the United Nations and has ably served as a peacekeeper, refugee worker, and administrator. He is an award-winning author of renowned fictional and non-fictional books, and his latest book, Pride, Prejudice, and Punditry, The Essential Shashi Tharoor, brings together the very best of his works. We are extremely honored to have you with us, sir. Pleasure. Very good to be with you, Rithman. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We will be moving on to the interactive session now. On to the first question of the day, sir. The singular thing about India is that you can only speak of it in the plural. There are many Indians. Everything exists in countless variants. This is a line I came across when reading your book. Across the 28 states and the eight union territories, thriving under cultural and traditional differences, we as a nation are told to be bound together as one. What did you mean by there being many Indias and how different are they from one another? Well, you know, as I've often pointed out in my writings, uh, any truism about India can be immediately contradicted by another truism about India. You know, we can say we are an ancient civilization, uh, but we're also a young republic. And you can say that uh, our IT and, and our other technology capacity is driving us uh, fast into the 21st century, but such a large portion of our population lives in each of the other 20 centuries. Um, our country's national motto, emblazoned on the government of crest, is Satya Meva Jayate. Truth alone triumphs. The question remains, however, whose truth? It's a question to which there are at least 1.4 billion answers if the last census hasn't undercounted us again. And that's why I say that we really have to find a simple answer to this as mystery. And it may lie in a simple insight. The singular thing about India is that you can only speak of it in the plural. That's what I mean by saying <coughs> there are many Indians because everything in our country exists in countless variants. There is no single standard, no fixed stereotype, no one way of doing things. Any custom, any cuisine, any style of clothing, anything in our country, um, one person may do it one way, somebody else might do it another way, sometimes at the same state in different parts of the country and so on. Even the yesterday and today, we are celebrating uh, one of the winter harvest festivals of our country. And it has different forms and different names and different ways of celebration in different parts of the country. So we are wishing each other happy Bihu, happy Makar Sankranti, happy Magaravalaka, uh, happy Lohri, uh, happy Pongal. Um, you know, this is India. We have all this diversity. And this is why my argument also extends that kind of pluralism to the way in which we arrange our own political affairs. All groups, faiths, states, ideologies survive and contend for their place in the sun. You know, um, you pick any generalization about India and you can get pushback, right? You can say that the opposite is also true. We are the world's largest democracy, but we are increasingly under one man rule. We have every religion known to mankind, but we are rushing headlong into a Hindu Rashtra and so on. That's the, the concern I have. So on the one hand, I celebrate <laughs> this diversity. On the other hand, I worry about the way in which uh, some people are trying to change it and reduce India to some sort of monolith. That was a very interesting answer. Thank you for that, sir. Moving on to the next question, we have Sanzia. Good evening, sir. I'd like Hello, to sir. ask, before the British arrived in India, the nation was not a singular entity not even centuries ago under the great emperor Ashoka's rule. Although we criticize the British 
for their rule over India, it could be said that the English language penetrated into Indian speech through the British. Eventually, over the decades, the language opened up a plethora of opportunities. For example, in the IT sector in the modern world. So could it be inferred in some way that the British amalgamated India? Would India have been better off if British had not ruled us? <laughs> Interesting. Well, I've written an entire book on that theme, so I, I, I'll try and give you a short summary of my answer. The fact is that uh, throughout the history of the subcontinent, there has existed an impunction for Indian unity. The idea of India is as old as the earliest Hindu scriptures, which describe Bharat Varsha as the land between the Himalayas and the seas. Uh, and this sacred geography, some would say, is essentially a Hindu idea. But Maulana Azad has written of how Indian Muslims, whether Pathans from the northwest or Tamils from the south, were all seen by Arabs as Hindi, hailing from a recognizable civilizational space. Numerous Indian rulers and dynasties had sought to unite the territory, with the Mauryas three centuries before Christ and the Mughals coming the closest by ruling almost 90% of the subcontinent. Had the British not completed the job, there's little doubt that some Indian ruler emulating his forerunners would have done so. In fact, far from crediting Britain for India's unity and, 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 our, and our democratic system, the facts point clearly to policies that undermined it. The dismantling of the existing political institutions when they came, the fomenting of communal division to a policy of divide and rule, which led to the partition of the country, and systematic political discrimination against Indians with a view to maintaining British domination. So I've argued in great detail in my, in my book, An Era of Darkness, that uh, uh, this sort of alleged gift that the British left us, um, frankly, uh, cannot be allowed to whitewash the misdeeds of the colonial enterprise, which was essentially a criminal enterprise based on imperial exploitation and plunder, rapacity and loot uh, and drainage of resources from India, which are too deeply documented, including by the British themselves, to be challengeable. So the best that people can say is, yes, the British really you know, um, exploited and, uh, and, 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 and drained us for 200 years, but they also left behind a great deal of lasting benefit. And the example you gave of political unity and democracy and the English language are two of the favorite examples, the others being uh, railways, uh, rule of law, and even crickets. Well, I, I won't have time to address all of those, but since you mentioned English, let me say that the English language was not a deliberate gift to India. It was a mere instrument of colonialism imparted to Indians uh, only with the explicit desire to secure British dominance, to facilitate British rule by teaching the language to a limited number of people to serve as intermediaries between the rulers and the ruled. The British had no desire to educate the Indian masses, nor were they willing to budget for such an expense. And what they did was to try and create, if you like, a, a small class of people who would collaborate with them. It is to the credit of Indians that they seized upon the English language as an instrument through which they could open the doors of knowledge and reading and learning, that they could challenge the British with, that they could assert Indian nationalism with and fight for Indian freedom with. And it's very important to, to understand that, uh, that everything the British did was only there to enhance their own control, uh, to serve British extractive interests and military dominance, perpetuate British rule, fulfill their interests, or simply increase their profits. Indians were never the intended, intended beneficiaries. So even the slightest smidgen of gratitude for the imperial enterprise is completely unjustified and unnecessary. They didn't do a single thing for the likes of you and me, uh, Scania. What they did was to strengthen their rule. And what many Indians did was to beat them at their own game. Uh, so they would set up one college in Calcutta. Rich Indians like Raja Ramohan Roy would set up seven, eight, nine colleges so that more Indians could take advantage than the British ever intended. Let's remember that we have really nothing to be grateful for. 
That was a very engrossing answer, sir. Thank you for that. The next question will be asked by Gauri Nanda. Over to you, Gauri Nanda. Good evening, Dr. Tharoor. Evening. You have mentioned about a famous debate over opposed ideas of heroic leadership. I'm sorry, you opposed ideas? Like Carla Tolson. Heroic leadership. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. Yes. Uh, by Carlyle and Tolstoy in your book. Correct, correct. While Tolstoy denies individual heroics are even possible, Carlyle argues that history is shaped by great leaders. So what are your views on collective organization as opposed to individual gallantry? And how important is it to have formidable leadership at the helm of any organization? <laughs> right, well, I mean, obviously I'm uh, a great believer in uh, in successful and effective leadership. Um, otherwise, you know, politics would be a very, very um, limited and poor place. I would argue that, um, that the truth lies somewhere between Tolstoy and Carlyle. That essentially, you do indeed have individual leaders making a big difference, but you also have them making a difference in the context of the circumstances available to them to make a difference with. And so if the circumstances are not propitious, um, it would take uh, an exceptional amount of, 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 of good fortune to be able to transform an entire nation, for example, or, or an entire era. Um, but that a period of history will throw up individuals who are capable of riding the crest of the historical currents of that time is, I think, a plausible idea. Um, you know, when you look back, for example, at our independence struggle, and you look at the extraordinary giants uh, who brought us to freedom, whether it's Gandhiji, Nehru, but not just them, a lot of lesser known figures, Jayaprakash Nara and Ram Manohar Lohia, Acharya Kripalani, Rajendra Prasad, Maulana Azad. You know, I can go on giving you 15, 20 names, each one of whom was a giant uh, in his or her own way. Dr. Ambedkar, for example, today is a, even uh, a larger figure in our historic consciousness than he was in his own lifetime. Now, all of this doesn't mean that somehow a whole bunch of heroes are born at the same time. It means that people of exception qualities are born in every era but certain circumstances bring the best out of them and allow them to have a transformative impact on a society. So that's basically where I would end up coming. I would say that current Indian politics actually gives you a very clear choice of, of leadership models. Uh, on the one hand, we have what we have seen in the last seven years, which is the sort of Alexander the Great kind of style of leadership, the hero on the white stallion charging down with upraised sword in his hand and his 56 in chest, saying that I will cut through the Gordian knots of all your problems. Uh, I have all the answers. I know what to do. Just trust me. And we have seen how poorly that particular model of leadership has worked. And then you have an alternative leadership that says, uh, I don't have all the answers. Let me come and work with you, the people, to figure out what it is that, that, that you need help you identify solutions and work with you to implement them, along with an entire team of highly qualified, experienced people to implement these solutions. Now, this kind of collective approach is, to my mind, what we, very frankly, um, can do better with. There's a very old Chinese verse going back to something like 2,500 years ago, in which a poet was writing about uh, kingship, of course, everyone was a king and there were no heroes or leaders in the conventional sense. But what that poet wrote was that the best kind, the worst kind of king, I beg your pardon, is the one who is feared and hated by people. The next worst is actually the one who is loved because he's doing too much to just please people. The best kind of king, he says, is the one who, whenever he achieves something, the people say, we did it ourselves. Now, can you imagine such an ancient idea, how relevant and topical it is today, that if you can see leadership as the act of bringing the best out of people, but letting them feel the ownership 
as stakeholders in what they're actually accomplishing and what you are accomplishing for them. That is the best kind of leadership rather than thumping your chest and saying, I will solve all your problems. It is saying, let us solve problems together. And I think in many ways, the latter is my preferred style of leadership in what I have done in my work as a senior UN official and what I do on a very modest level in leading my own teams, um, whether in my offices in Delhi or Trivandrum, whatever. Uh, I believe very strongly in trying to have a collective sense of ownership of one's uh, successes and achievements. Those views are indeed enthralling, sir. Now, we have Vignesh to ask the next question. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Vignesh. You've referred to yourself as a child of the Indian newspaper. As someone who has seen media evolve over the years, you've expressed with deep regret that 24 by 7 television news channels have become a range of increasingly breathless and hysterical shows aimed at attracting the highest number of eyeballs and ratings. You've also ridiculed media sourcing news from people's Twitter feed and Facebook posts. What measures do you think need to be taken to restore people's eroding trust in the media? Oh, well, that's, that's not easy to answer. I am literally uh, a child of the Indian newspaper. My late father, Chandran Tharoop, started in the newspaper business and barely out of college, representing a pair of Indian newspapers in post-war London. And he spent his working life as a senior advertising executive for some of our country's better known mastheads. So as a result of this, growing up in Bombay and Calcutta, I enjoyed reading three or four newspapers every morning. Then during the day, the papers from the rest of the country would be flown in. My father would bring them home after work. And then I would have a second round of newsprint to digest. So I, I, I literally grew up doing this. I've been to a newspaper printing press as a child. I almost feel I have newspaper ink uh, running in my veins. I'm a huge fan uh, of the media and of the traditional values of the media. That daily morning ritual of tea and newspapers alongside my father gave me an early and abiding passion for the Indian press and that I've sustained it during even all my decades abroad. I would have Indian newspapers sent to me in places like Geneva, Singapore, and New York. And uh, that was before internet existed and you couldn't read them online. So they would literally be flown. Uh, sometimes I'd be reading news a week later, 10 days later, but to me, that was still so important to me. And of course, I, I wrote occasional pieces for Indian newspapers. I maintained columns in three top newspapers, uh, the Hindu, the Indian Express, and the Times of India at different times. Now, my sentimental attachment has not blinded me to the crisis of the Indian press, because it's now become very clear that the Indian press that I have directly been exposed to since I returned to India and came into Indian politics in the last 12, 13 years now, is that barring the occasional exception the media now chooses sensationalism and superficiality uh, over any journalistic commitment to truth and objectivity. Uh, now, I firmly believe in the indispensability of a free press in any society, especially in holding the ruling dispensation accountable for its actions. So my argument, my answer to you is we continue to need journalists who are critical in guiding our journey to becoming a more aware informed, empathetic, and inclusive society. So what we need is better journalism. Uh, I want to see uh, more respect for facts, um, less willingness to color the facts with your own biases, which are very often political biases, or sometimes some would say even worse, commercial biases. That is whatever will sell more copies or attract more eyeballs to your channel uh, is what you go with rather than what is actually uh, objectively uh, truthful, uh, that, that we should certainly uh, try and encourage a culture of journalism and news, which um, has a consciousness of its impact on society, that says our job is to hold a mirror up to our society, show it what is going wrong and what is going right, include everybody, not just focus on a, on a handful of so-called breaking news stories, but usually about breaking people as well. Um, 
try and keep people informed so they are better citizens and more effective citizens in our democracy. These are not impossible tasks. This is, in fact, uh, what uh, you know, journalists, uh, students of journalism are taught in every democracy in the world. But somehow our media seems to have lost sight of it. And I really hope that we can get away from some of the third-rate practitioners of tawdry, uh, dishonest, uh, TRP-hungry, and, and superficial journalism. Uh, and sadly, these are sometimes some of the better known and better paid and more followed people in our media. And let us move towards a kind of, of journalism that in many democracies is hailed as keeping society healthy and, and flourishing. Thank you for that answer, sir. Next up with the question, we have Harshit. Good evening, sir. Sir, you have stated that television did not exist in the Bombay of your boyhood and Nintendo yeah. or PlayStation were not even a gleam in an inventor's eye. So <laughs> do you ever hark back to the Bombay of your boyhood and feel a sense of regret, feeling that you missed out on the forms of entertainment that we consider as joyous in our present world? Actually, you know something, Harshit, uh, I actually am very happy to embrace change. Um, I mean, I must say that uh, I would have enjoyed watching television, my boy, and I'm sure I would have enjoyed uh, playing Nintendo or PlayStation. I'm sure I would have enjoyed being able to go on the internet. And I think that, um, that, uh, that you know, my children's generation uh, are, um, uh, had, had all of those things available to them. And their kids are now born and will be growing up into a world where multiple options are always available. So I'm not a Luddite or a, or, a, or a troglodyte saying I want to go back into the cave and go into, into the pure old life and all the world of books. No, I am describing my own reality and my experience. I only had books. So for me, books were my entertainment, my education, my escape, uh, including from my being confined to bed with asthma, which uh, made it very difficult for me to go out and play physically. Uh, and therefore, I became a, a much more a man of words and reading. But I do believe that some of the balance needs to be maintained. After all, um, television gives you fairly passive entertainment. You're a recipient of somebody else's vision, somebody else's performance of that vision, somebody else's depiction of the performance of that vision. Everything has been done by somebody else. You are just sitting there uh, like a vessel into which water is being poured, the entertainment is being poured into. What is with books? You need to be educated and literate and know the words and make an effort to engage with it and activate your own imagination to imagine the characters that are being described, to understand the situations that are being depicted or the books that the, if it's nonfiction, then the arguments that are being made. Books demand a little more out of you. And I would hope that youngsters will not deprive themselves of the need to challenge themselves as well. I think that just as a certain, let's say my generation had books and then when they wanted it, they could go to a movie theater and watch movies and if necessary, leave their brains behind <laughs> and, and enjoy the entertainment. I could say that similarly today, let's have all these multiple options available, but let's maintain a balance amongst them. Um, it would be a great pity if today's young essentially abandon some of the strengths of what was available in the past by only focusing on the easy, um, shall we say, uh, pre-digested material that they could easily indulge in as well. Um, and so if we can strike the balance, if people are given a chance um, uh, to discover for themselves what appeals to them, but at the same time, to have enough mastery of basic skills of reading so they know that that is an option that they lead and must have and must maintain, even while they can go out and watch TV or computer games or mobile phones or internet or whatever. If you can do that, then I think we can all be very happy. I'm not anti anything. I just want, um, in my own life, I had only one thing as a kid. Today, I have all these other options, but you know, um, obviously I'm too old for Nintendo and PlayStation. And I, don't have enough time for all the other distractions. I don't see as many movies as I might otherwise like and so on. 
or as many soap operas or as many serials on Netflix and so on. There's no, not enough time in the day. But for those who have the time, I hope they will also try and apportion it so they sample a little bit of everything that's available to them rather than getting completely immersed in what's easily consumed and digested. Thank you, sir. Up next, we have Anvit with the sixth question of the day. Over to you, Anvit. So you stated that it was deeply frustrating to lose some of your best staff at 60 and an age when many of them seem to be in the prime of the professional lives. And I've never been more assured or more that productivity. Does this stem from the fact that your career was an upward rise at times when people reach the ends of their professional lives? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question terribly clearly. And I don't know if it's my headphone or your mic. Uh, would you yeah. mind summarizing it again for me? I, I don't I'll think I got it. I'll, I'll repeat it again, sir. You stated that it was it was deeply frustrating to lose some of your best staff at 60, an age when uh, yeah. most of them seem to be in the prime of their professional careers. Right. And have never been more assured or, or more yeah. productivity. Does, does this stem from the fact that your career was an upward rise at times when people reach the ends of their professional lives? You know, the thing is that um, I, don't, I don't think that an arbitrary number is actually uh, a reflection of anything. And I know that human beings like to organize themselves predictably. And so every country, uh, almost every country uh, and every profession tends to have a compulsory retirement age. And that, that means an objective standard is there. No one can be accused of favoring somebody else. I like your face, so I let you work till 65. I don't like her face, so I let her go at 50. None of that can be done if there is an arbitrary one flat number. But the truth is that every human being is different. There are some people who in their 50s are way past any useful contribution they can make, and ideally we should let them go. There are some who well into their 60s or 70s could be incredibly productive, hardworking, dedicated, and effective contributors to an enterprise, a company, a government, a society. Um, there's no easy answer, right? Because when you set up a system, you very often know that you can't build subjectivity into it, and therefore a compulsory retirement age is objective. Um, there may also be social factors. For example, how do you create job openings for young people by making the not so young retire? <laughs> then others climb up and openings arise. And so, for example, in Kerala, we have the ridiculous situation of a retirement age of 56 in government service and even the government teachers and so on. Now, 56 is frankly nothing in today's day and age. The person probably has another 30 years of effective life ahead of them. And what is happening is that Kerala is adding to its pension burden by letting people go. But young people will never allow them to expand the retirement age because young people say then they're preventing us from coming in to the vacancies that, that would, would uh, no longer be available. Now, the problem with all of this is that um, I think we have a, a phenomenon where well, other countries in the world are systematically raising their retirement age. The UN, for example, has gone up to 65. It was 60 when I joined. Now the UN retirement age is 65. I've heard of some Austrian, uh, I think it is, uh, some European country, I think it is Austria, where now government servants and diplomats are expected to work till 70 and 75. So um, each country is deciding that given people's uh, uh, longevity, why should the government pay them a pension to sit at home when they can still contribute? There are other systems, the US, for example, does not permit any compulsory retirement age by law, uh, but... Um, they have alternative systems so that, for example, in government service, they'll say that uh, at any age in your career, you can only work a certain number of years at a particular level. Either you're good enough to be promoted to the next level or you have to leave at the end of that. So you could be forced out of a job in your, at the age of early 50s, for example, if you have spent, say, six, seven years at a particular grade and you are not considered good enough to promote to the next grade, you leave at 50. Uh, on the other hand, you can keep on getting promoted and go on till your 70s if you want, and you don't have the right to retire until you've accumulated a certain number of years of service. So there are various ways you can do all this. I found at the UN, uh, I was sometimes carrying people who were dead wood from their 40s onwards, and I was losing people in their 60s who really 
were absolutely ready to contribute and were contributing, uh, uh, but, but had to go because that was the rule. This is the kind of situation we have now. In India, we do have exceptions. They're called extensions. Uh, in fact, uh, the most famous example recently is our foreign minister, Jay Shankar. One day before he was supposed to retire at the age of 60, the government appointed him foreign secretary, which gave him a two-year tenure. Then, as the two years was running out, he was given a one-year extension. Then after that, he left government, went off to the private sector, and two years later, he was brought back uh, as foreign minister. So uh, somebody who is essentially who would have been forced to retire six, seven years ago is serving the country effectively today. Now, when you look at that, you realize that there is something wrong with any system that says at a particular date or a particular year, you're useless. You can indeed be very useful indeed. A very thought-provoking answer indeed, sir. Thank you for that. Coming up with the next question, we have Krisha. Uh, good evening, sir. Hi, Krisha. Uh, when asked about your reading a book a day, you stated clearly that you seize every opportunity to make it abundantly clear that you would never recommend it to anyone. That's right. On a slightly different tangent to the fact that you completed the hashtag 365 book challenge, as you have put it in your book, was this a slight peek into your future of being able to complete a doctorate at an astonishingly young age of 22? No, I mean, you know, I, 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 uh, I was really, <laughs> there's a famous line of uh, Dr. Johnson who said, uh, Samuel Johnson, that a hanging in the morning concentrates the mind most wonderfully. If you're going to be hanged in the morning tomorrow, you have absolutely no choice but to do urgent productive work right now. In the same way, um, I, my scholarship would have run out. I mean, I had uh, the, the uh, full scholarship from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. In those days, Indian salaries were very modest. There was no question of my father being able to support me, uh, especially once you converted his monthly salary into dollars. It would have put him below the poverty line in America. So there was no question of... Uh, of that, I had to absolutely get my work done before I ran out of the means to support myself and to eat and live and so on. And so that kind of hanging in the morning uh, kept me working very hard and I did it. Uh, but I also um, took advantage of certain academic rules which have since been abolished. In fact, the Fletcher School um, has told me and told others that uh, they're proud of me and they put me in one of their academic catalogs and wrote about my extraordinary finishing my PhD this young and so on. But they also said that the particular uh, rules under which I did it, something called an academic petition where I can ask to short circuit certain procedures. Uh, I was able to take my master's orals and my PhD orals in the same exam, but normally they need to be a year apart. I was able to get other requirements waived. All of those things are no longer possible. So nobody else uh, is going to be able, at least from the Fletcher School, to get a PhD at the age that I did. Uh, it's a dubious record to carry to my <laughs> sort of to my obituary, but there you are, I have it. Um, and I, I, I look back on it uh, in some ways with a sense of exhilaration because I worked 18 hour days in, in assimilating my research and writing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I also look on it with a sense of what was that all about? I could have enjoyed my early twenties uh, as, as many others do. Um, you know, uh, got more out of life than sitting inside a room working away and writing. And I hardly went out and entertained myself and had the experiences that people in their early 20s deserve to have as part of growing up. So I'm not saying that my anything that I've done is at all worth modeling your own lives on. I did what I did. My circumstances directed me, as it were, to do them in a certain way. But I would encourage all of you to enjoy life. There is more to life than a string of letters after your name or, or, a, or a, a, a figure in your bank account or a set of titles to add to your CV. Life is also about uh, not just living it, but being enriched by it. And I think there's a lot more to life than, than, than conventional accomplishments alone. So good luck to all of you in having a great time while growing up. A really insightful answer, sir.
Thank you. We now have Sahil to ask you the next question. Good evening, sir. You have expressed your love towards cricket, recalling encounters played between India, England, and India, Pakistan, and how India seems to have an edge against its rivals, especially since the 21st century. You've also stated that during recent years, India has evolved into a formidable team and that defeat is increasingly an anomaly. In spite of such positive influences for Indian cricket, your take on India's failed geniuses is a harsh reality on the sport. A lot of cricketers, although booming in potential, aren't able to achieve success. What reasons do you believe causes this, especially in a country like India, where cricket is an extremely popular sport and there isn't a shortage of geniuses here? Um. Yeah, I, I got about 70% of what you asked. I'm really sorry about the sound system. It may be a yeah, I But, but um, um, just to repeat the last words of your question, I got, I got most of the first half. What was your last thrust in of your question? In spite of positive influences for Indian cricket, your take on India's failed geniuses is a harsh reality in the sport. A lot of cricketers, although blooming in potential, aren't able to achieve success. What reasons do you believe caused this? especially in a country like India, where cricket is an extremely popular sport and there isn't a shortage of geniuses here. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, part of the answer is that there isn't a shortage. There's so many people to compete against. You can find somebody, for example, like young Unmuk Chand, who was, uh, um, you know, one of the top uh, under-19 uh, batsmen in the world and led India to a World Cup. Uh, and within two, three years, uh, he couldn't hold a place in the Delhi Ranji team. Uh, because there's so much competition from late bloomers and others who've come up and are working out. It's a sport that requires uh, a combination of very hard work, regular training, amazing physical fitness, and at the same time, a certain amount of good fortune. All of them have to fall into place for you to be consistently successful. And uh, we are seeing, for example, today after the, uh, the, the defeat by South Africa in two successive matches where our batting failed uh, twice over, that uh, the, the knives are already out for some of our players who have, over the years, given us extraordinary service. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that Pujara was scoring three or four centuries in a tour of Australia. Rahane has scored centuries in every foreign country. Uh, but it's almost certain that they'll both be dropped uh, for India's next test match against Sri Lanka because there are so many others waiting. Um, you know, how long a rope can you give people in a country where... The number of people versus the number of opportunities is always going to be so much that it's a constant struggle to fight, to cling on to what you've accomplished. And I must say that uh, that's, that's one very major aspect of it. Um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, the, some of the things that used to be said in the past when I was growing up, that sometimes selection was influenced by politics or favoritism or even uh, at lower levels of a talk of corruption. All that is now ended. Now there's just too much public scrutiny and too much riding at stake in the game for any of those things uh, to get you into an India team. You can be anybody's son or daughter. You can be anybody's uh, uh, favorite. Uh, you, know, you may have a godfather in the most powerful position in the land. But if you're not able to perform, you cannot survive the relentless scrutiny. And therefore, I think all I can say is what, what I've said to you now, that I think uh, some people will struggle because no one can excel all the time, particularly at any activity in which one of the variables is the performance of others. You might be in superb form and you may just get one incredibly unplayable ball that, uh, that you, know, you have no choice but to defend and that takes a nick and goes off the catch and you're gone for zero. And no one knows that you actually had the ability to score essentially if you hadn't got that ball, you know. That's cricket. That's life. In many ways, uh, in the great Indian novel, I've written about um, uh, how it's sort of very much like the Hindu idea of fate. You know, that it's just when you're seeing the ball perfectly and timing the fours off the sweet of the bat that the unplayable shooter will come along and bowl you. Because that's karma. That's that's the, the way in which destiny has been written for you. Uh, so a certain amount of fatalism helps, I think, in absorbing the ups and downs of a sport like this. But uh, it's a relentless struggle. The rewards, fortunately, are also incredibly high. And if you have talent, uh, at some point, you should be able to taste those rewards. Whether you can hold on to them and keep on tasting those rewards is something that remains to be seen. 
we are delighted to know that you are a fan of cricket as well. Thank you, sir, for that answer. Thanks, sir. I'm running out of time, Hamid. How much longer do we have? It's just a couple of questions more, sir, and okay. we'll be done with. Go ahead. Move, moving on, we have Shreya for the next question, which I think is on everybody's minds. Good evening, sir. Hi, Shreya. Uh, so your command of the English language has long been subject to praise and has been something for all of us to look up to. You started writing at an extremely tender age of 10 and you had immense motivation from your family to get into the literary space. Moreover, it is extremely well known that your vocabulary is more than sufficient to be uh, phrased into a dictionary in itself. So what aspect of your writing journey do you consider the most imperative to your success as a writer? Thank you. I would say simply, very simply, it's reading. Uh, in fact, every time that I find myself before an audience of young people and somebody says, oh, teach us an important word, something like that, my answer always is the most important word is a very simple, short one, read. Because the more you read, the more you will accomplish, uh, the more you will, first of all, um, acquire a vocabulary and acquire a dominance of the language. Because every time you come across the same word in three different books or three different contexts, you'll understand of the word by the company it keeps, you'll understand the nuances of its usage, you'll understand the context. And then secondly, you will be a better writer if you've read a lot, because then you'll know what other writers have done with language. You will see uh, different styles, you will see different ways of unfolding a narrative, you will see different ways of pushing a particular message across. All of these things um, give you an opportunity just for yourself. I'm not urging anyone to imitate anybody else. But maybe to start off with, you will find yourself influenced by the kind of reading you do. And therefore, the more widely you read, the more would be the diversity of influences upon you and the better the prospects of you forging your own uh, style. Uh, finally, there's a question of content. And content has to come from inside you. As George Bernard Shaw famously said, I write for the same reason a cow gives milk. It's inside you. It has to come out. And like an unmilked cow, I've been real distress about it. If I didn't, if it didn't, I write because I feel I have to, because there's something I want to say or many things I want to say. And at the same time, writing continues to be a source of joy in my life and work. Um, it's also true that when you have so little time to write, in my case, given my full time responsibilities as an MP and a politician, uh, there's very, very limited time. And often it's at the very end of your day. So then you want your effort to be meaningful. Writing always comes at the expense of other things, your family, friends, entertainment, social engagements, and so on. So you really want to use that time in a very focused and effective way. That's why I write because I have something to say. Occasionally, I write diverting fly pieces just for pleasure. But most of my writing takes up issues that I belong, believe are important to address in the national conversation. And I try to limit myself to subjects in which I believe I have something worthwhile to say to my readers. We, are, we all are indeed in awe of your mastery of the language. Thank you, sir. We do understand we are running out of time. So wrapping up with one quick question we have from Kashini. Over to you. Good evening, sir. Um, it is well known that every argument is best proven using relevant statistics and evidences. And you always seem to have some at your fingertips. How do you retain so much information across such a wide range of topics? I think it has to do with interest, Arshini. I mean, if, you, if you're interested in something, then what you read will stick in your head. If you're reading it out of a sense of duty or obligation or studying for an exam or something like that, it simply won't stay. Maybe it'll stay in the short-term memory so you can regurgitate in the examination the next day. And then you'll forget it. That's the honest truth. Whereas if something really uh, interests you and goes into passions, your brain has a way of putting it into that section of your brain's hard drive that you can always retrieve the numbers that matter. Um, I, I agree with you that numbers can be very, very useful. Um, uh, that, that, you know, um, <laughs> but at the same time, um, there's a lovely old comment, which I'm sorry is not mine, because I would have loved to have said it, that too many people use facts and statistics as a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. You can imagine a drunk person leaning on a lamppost not because the light is above, but because it needs to hold on to something from up to fall. 
And so a lot of people throw in statistics and facts and uh, 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 which are not particularly relevant to the quality of the argument being made. Um, I think one has to strike a balance between those two things. Uh, facts stick in my head, numbers stick in my head, dates uh, as a fan of history stick in my head, um, and therefore I'm able to come out with them. But if I suddenly have a, a senior moment and I can't remember a particular figure or a particular date or a particular number, uh, I don't really feel that um, I need to make one up. I mean, I can just say truthfully, um, I don't remember the exact number, but this is broadly the point I want to make. In other words, the substance of the point is more important than the detail. The detail amplifies and sometimes strengthens the case you're making, but uh, ultimately it is the case that matters, the argument that matters, the, uh, the, the, the uh, understanding you're trying to convey that should matter. And the, the statistics in fact should only be to embellish and perhaps if you like give, give some ballast to the argument, the argument is still the most important. Thank you, sir, for all the intriguing answers you have given us today. I'm sure that the audience would have been really thrilled to tune in. With that, we have come to the end of the fireside chat now. It was really inspiring and insightful to chat with you, Dr. Tharu, today. Thank you, Ritman. We, we believe that the audience would have enjoyed every minute of it. Once again, I take pleasure in thanking you for your presence today. We also thank our viewers, and we hope that you have had a memorable experience. Please fill the feedback form shared in the YouTube chat, which will help us improve in the upcoming sessions. Coming up next, we have Biswa Kalyan Rath's comedy show streamed on our Shastra 2022 platform at 7 p.m. Also, stay tuned to Shastra IIT Madras's YouTube channel for the last two Spotlight lectures tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All the very best and uh, wish you a very successful Shastra 2022. Yes, yeah. sir. sir if, uh, if possible.